All right, let's take a look at this review warm up. So again, this is sort of practice for the test that you will be taking um, next block. All right, so the first one just says use your calculator to find the mean and standard deviation of the data. So like I said in class, I'm not going to ask you to calculate standard deviation by hand, um, but you should be able to get it off the calculator if I ask for that. So I've already gone ahead and taken time to put all of that data into L1. Once it's in L1, I can go to stat calc, one variable stats. It's in list one there. And then from this output, S of X, which is the fourth one down, is your sample standard deviation. All right. Just below that is your population standard deviation. Um, if you don't remember the symbols, try to remember that the sample one should always be larger because we're dividing by n minus 1. And the population is always going to be smaller because you're dividing by just n. And then up here, x bar is our average. So for this problem, we would say x bar equals 7.31. And standard deviation equals 0.9. 977. Okay. Question two says find the five number summary. So really this is just making sure you know what the five number summary is. So it is your min, your quartile one, your median, which could also be called quartile two, quartile three, and your maximum. All right. And luckily those are all right here in that same report. So min is five, quartile one is seven, median is 7.25, quartile three is eight, and max is nine. Eight, seven point two five. All right. So these right here are the pieces that make up a five number summary. And just make sure that you're that you remember you know what is included in the five number summary because a lot of times kids try to give me the mean or the standard deviation and then they lose points so just make sure that you recognize that those are the five numbers that are part of the five number summary and then we use those numbers um to create box plots all right now in a stats class we have to check for outliers before we make our box plot so our test for outliers are Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, right? And IQR is just Q3 minus Q1, which in our case, 8 minus 7 or just one. So our IQR is one, which is going to make it pretty easy. All right. So Q1 was seven. All right. If we subtract one times 1.5, that gives us 5.5. Um, Q3 was eight. So if we do eight plus one times 1.5, that gives us 9.5. So if we go and look back at our data, we have to see if we have anything below 5.5 and anything above 9.5. Well, we already know our max is nine, so we don't have anything above 9.5, but we can see our min here is five. So we're gonna have at least one outlier. And then let's just scan the data quick. There's the five. And then just make sure there aren't any other observations that are below that. All right, they are not. So five is our lowest observation. Now to actually make this graph, we're now going to need to know what's the next lowest observation because our whisker of our box plot, our box and whisker plot only now goes to the lowest non outlier. So there's a six. Let's see if there's anything lower than a six. All right, there is not. 
So our whisker is only going to extend out to the six. So when we make our box plot, I'm going to make this five. That's 5.5. That's six. 6.5, seven. 7.5, eight. 8.5, nine. All right, so there's our number line. We're going to put an asterisk at the five to designate that it's an outlier. Our whisker is going to only extend to the lowest non-outlier, which is at six. So that's going to be what our whisker extends to. Then we're going to start our box at the seven. All right, we'll have our median line at 7.25, which is right there. We'll have the end of our box at 8, which is quartile 3. And then because we don't have any outliers on the high side, the whisker will extend all the way to our max. All right, so this is what sort of the final box plot would look like. Um, you have to make sure that you're designating outliers with an asterisk to get full credit on these. All right. And also remember, you can do these on the calculator. And if it doesn't specify that I need to sh see your work, um, you are welcome to do this. So I can go to stat plot. All right. Make sure that stat plot one is on. Make sure that you selected the box and whisker that has the little dots with it. So that one's already selected. And then you can go to zoom nine. And there's that box plot. And if you hit trace, you can see, oh, there's the asterisk outlier at five. There's the lowest non-outlier at six. There's seven, 7.25, eight, and nine, um, just like we did by hand, okay? But you do wanna make sure you know how to do a box plot. All right, suppose four more values were added to the data, each exactly equal to the mean. Would this have any impact on the standard deviation? Explain without using calculations. So yes, this would have an impact on the standard deviation. All right, so yes, it would lower the standard deviation. And the reason for that We are adding four observations that are zero distance from the mean. And since standard deviation is the average distance from the mean, these zeros will drag it down. Sorry for the run on sentence, but you get the point. All right. So if we're adding four observations exactly equal to the mean, that means those are four observations that are zero distance from the mean, which is gonna drag down that average and lower your standard deviation. All right, taking a look at the back. You suspect that there is a relationship between teenagers' preference in movies and their preference in pizza. You ask 110 students, at your school to choose between three movies and three pizza types. Here are your results. Calculate the marginal distribution of movie preference is in percents. So first things first, if I don't have table totals, I'm going to add table totals. So I'm gonna add a total here and I'm gonna add a total here because you're almost always gonna need that information anyways. So 35, this would be 45. 27 plus eight is 35. 15 is another 30 right there. 70, 80, and then there's 110 people in total, which is what the problem told us. And then going down in this direction, this would be 43. This would be 33. This would be 34. 
Okay. Now, marginal distribution of movie preference, all right, means we're dealing with percentages for just the movie preferences, and we're basically pretending like pizza wasn't even a question, all right? We're using these numbers at the margins, all right? Marginal distribution, we use the numbers at the margins. So we'd basically be calculating a percentage for Princess Bride. So Princess Bride would be... 45 out of 110. Um, the Big Lebowski would be 35 out of 110. And then the Land Before Time T would be 30 out of 110. All right. A marginal distribution is always out of the table total. And then we just actually want to report those as percents. So we could report this one as 0 0.4091. Now, I'm fine with you leaving it like this. You could also rewrite it like this. Um, but don't just throw the percent sign on here. 0.4091% is a totally different number. It's either 0 0.4091 or it's 40.91%. All right, the next one would be 0.3182. And then the last one would be 0.2727. Okay, so again, either leave it just as a decimal, which would be my recommendation so that you don't actually goof something up. Or if you put the percent sign there, make sure you slide that decimal two spots to the right. So 31.82%, 27.27%. All right. So I don't care which way you do it, but if you're going to do it, make sure you do it correctly. All right. Number six, find the conditional distribution of pizza preference. All right. For each movie preference in percent. So that means we're finding percentages related to pizza, like what percent like pepperoni, what percent like meatball, what percent like mushroom, because we're finding the conditional distribution of pizza preference. So our percentages should deal with pizza, not with movies. And then it's telling us we're doing it for each movie preference. So for Princess Bride, what percent like pepperoni, what percent like meatball, what percent like mushroom. So effectively we're going across the table here. So for Princess Bride, if we're looking at pepperoni, um, it's 20 out of 45. If we're looking at meatball, it's 15 out of 45. And then if we're looking at the mushroom, it's 10 out of 45, all right? And then we would have to repeat that once for each movie. Okay, and then the problem does say that these should be in percents. So this would be 0.4444. This one would be 0.3333. This one would be 0.2222. And yes, those don't add up to exactly one. There's what we call round off error. Um, but that's fine. You don't have to like modify one just so that they add up to one. It's just, it's recognized that that happens sometimes. And then we would just repeat the process. All right. So for Big Lebowski, we would do the same thing. Only now it would be eight out of 35. It would be 16 out of 35. And it would be 11 out of 35. And then we would go through and again, just make sure you're actually giving me those as percents. Don't just leave them as the fraction, if that's what the problem asks for. So this one would be 0 0.2286. This one would be 4571. And this one would be 0 0.3143. All right. And then last but not least, land before time. So just kind of... All right, so we'll do land before time here. And then we need pizza, meatball, and mushroom again at the top. 
All right, so land before time would have been 15 out of 30, 2 out of 30, and 13 out of 30. So again, we're going across the row and using that row total um, for each of these different ones. So 15 out of 30, that one's obviously just going to be 0.50. Um, 2 out of 30 is going to be 0.0667. 0667. And this last one, 13 out of 30, is going to be whatever's left over, which is 0.4333. Okay. Now, again, I went to four decimals on all of these. I'm really not worried about that. Um, as long as whatever you do is consistent and whatever you do is rounded correctly, um, that's my main concern. You know, if you round incorrectly, that's going to cost you points. But if you choose to go to the tenth or the hundredth or the thousandth or whatever, I'm not really going to worry about that one way or another. Okay, so let's take a look at the last question here. So this is all about making a histogram. So I have a bunch of data here, and I'm going to use this data to create a histogram down below. So it says, choose an appropriate bin width and scale and label each axis. So I can see that this basically goes from like 10 up to 50. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at 10. And then I'm going to have each, um, each bar represent 10 values. So this is going to go from 10 to less than 20. All right. And notice I use the little less than sign there so that it's clear which bar contains 20. All right. This next one will be from 20 to less than 30. And then the next one from 30 to less than 40. And then the next one from 40 to less than 50. And then the final one is from 50 to less than 60. All right. And we do need this final bar because this observation of 50 is going to fall over here. All right. And then on the left hand side, um, a histogram, remember, is always counts or percentages. And in this case, we're going to do counts. Um, percentages would be a relative histogram. All right. And then the, the unit for down below is it looks like we're measuring the angle. Um, so this would be like degrees. Now, I'm not going to make my scale here, here, here until I have like an idea of how many fall in each group. So I can see that right here, this is going to be my first bar. All right. These are all the values that are from 10 to less than 20. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those. All right. Right here. and then it continues on down here, are all the observations that are from 20 to less than 30. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 observations there. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Let's just do it this way. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten observations here. There's going to be zero observations in the 40 to less than 50 bar. And then there's going to be one observation in that final bar there. All right. So why don't we go up by fives? And we'll say this is five. This is 10. This is 15. And this is 20. All right. So that first bar is going to have a height of seven. All right. And again, I'm not going to be sitting here with a ruler making sure that this is exactly seven as long as it's in the right neighborhood. Um, the next bar should be 20. So there's my 20 bar. Then I have a bar at 10. 
right? Then I have a blank space, and then I have a bar of one. And we generally said that a histogram should always have five bars. I know this one only has four, but this would count as a bar. So this is my fifth bar right here, All right? So here's a histogram. Again, you're creating these categories, and then you're counting how many observations fall inside of each category, All right? So I hope this was useful. Um, you should spend the rest of today kind of working through that practice test. And again, using that as sort of preparation for the in-class exam next time, because that will be closed book. So you're not going to be able to use your notes during that. All right. Best of luck. And I will see you when I see you.